Whoa there. Careful with that SKS. You wouldn't want to go violating section 922R, would you? Don't you know? It's a cardinal sin, punishable by hanging, to play around with foreign-made gun bits. It's worse than arson or horse theft, and could land you in jail for five years or a quarter million dollars in debt to Uncle Sam. You don't know why? Well, you're not alone. It goes all the way back to the Civil Rights era, President Bush, and more. So let's talk about it. While the host of Fudbusters is a lawyer, he is not your lawyer. If you pay him, maybe, either way you slice it, the video that you are about to watch is not to be construed as legal advice. It might be confusing to you that, in a country whose independence was made possible through the surreptitious importing of military arms from France, Spain, and the Netherlands, that you could face criminal consequences for having a trigger that wasn't made in the United States. That confusion is rational. And it's because Title 18, Section 922R, is a confusing mess when viewed on its own. I hope to provide some context in this episode for the law. Now, this context won't make the law seem sensible, but let's take a look anyway, and finish with what it might mean for us in a practical sense. Let's start by going back to an old favorite, the Gun Control Act of 1968. Now, this law is going to need its own video pretty soon, because it's got a deep, seedy, and wildly racist history. It's what set up the system of FFLs and licensed importers that we know and love oh so much. One of the things the GCA did was generally prohibit importing firearms that were not particularly suitable or adaptable to sporting purposes. Why? Well, the problem is those damn Europeans, they kept making really affordable handguns that were massively popular with working class Americans. The federal government saw poor and minority Americans being empowered to affordably and somewhat effectively arm themselves, and they looked at this and said, well, we, we can't have that. Although the act refers to rifles and shotguns, remember, the focus at the time was handguns. The NFA had only narrowly failed to ban handguns, and the general public was still pretty widely against handgun ownership. In the discussions prior to the GCA's passage, Congress never even mentioned non-sporting rifles and shotguns. The focus was clearly on handguns and military surplus firearms, with a particular focus on the fact that Kennedy had been killed with an Italian-imported surplus military rifle. Despite the fact that the weapon in question was a fairly sporterized bolt-action rifle, it's clear from the legislative history that Kennedy's assassination and the Carcano rifle was a catalyst to import controls in the Gun Control Act. An irrational catalyst, but even back then, the word military was spooky enough to eschew objective discussion. So after its passage, we had this sporting purposes language, and nothing to really tie it to. So the first thing the feds did to implement this was develop a test to see whether pistols and revolvers were sporty or not. Within months of enactment, they sat down with a bunch of dweebs from gun magazines, the industry, and some government folks, and all decided that sporty pistols are huge. So no more importing small guns. Those are for pores, and the government hates pores. But what did those dweebs have to say about rifles and shotguns? Well, nothing. I'm not joking. They saw no reason to even develop a test for non-sporting rifles and shotguns. From then until the mid-80s, I can't even find any evidence of the ATF disqualifying non-surplus rifles or shotguns from importation for being non-sporting. Just as an aside, you might be wondering why there's this fixation on sporting firearms. After all, there's nothing in the Second Amendment that really refers to white tails or clay shooting or whatever. Well, I don't know. <laughs> in 1984, though, ATF started spazzing out a little bit when they found out people were buying funky shotguns. They classified the Street Sweeper as non-sporting, preventing its importation from South Africa, citing its large capacity and development as kind of a paramilitary firearm. Then, in 1986, ATF did the same thing with the USAS-12, citing its hugeness as evidence of its lack of sporting character. Yes, even though hugeness was a factor making a pistol sporting. <laughs> Classic ATF. So here's where things get rolling. Let's recap real quick. Up to this point, since 68, we went from kind of having a little freedom left to the government passing an import ban, except for sporting firearms, which they defined as basically big target pistols, 
Then, quickly, they ban importations of all military surplus long guns, ignoring non-military long guns, until suddenly they got freaked out by a couple of big shotguns. Oh, and now milserps are okay if they're sporty. But now it's 1989. We've got a great big Republican in office. Wow. He's, you know, gonna protect our rights or whatever. But hold on. There's a problem. It's those damn foreigners again. They're selling us guns. Good guns. For cheap. You know why that's an issue, right? Yep. We can't let the poor have nice Chinese AKs, Uzis and stuff. Especially not when we're at the apex of one of the first assault weapon scares. There was a school shooting in California where the killer used a Chinese Type 56 AK. Immediately after this, President Bush had his ATF suspend and then ban the importation of these semi-automatic assault rifles. Over the next year, the ATF expanded its import ban of semi-automatic rifles, deeming them not at all sporty, citing characteristics of the arm as being common to military firearms, mirroring the language we'd see in contemporary assault weapon bans. Generally, the factors considered in determining whether a rifle is sporting, according to the feds, is whether it's a semi-automatic version of a machine gun, whether it's chambered in an intermediate cartridge, that being under two and a quarter inches in length, and whether it has any of the now typical assault weapon features, including ability to accept a detachable magazine larger than 10 rounds, having a foldy or slidey stock, second pistol grip, a bayonet lug, flash hider, bipod, integral grenade launcher, or night sights. So the Bush administration solved the problem. There were no more of these damn guns coming in. Except there were. You see, Americans are a resilient people. They saw these import restrictions and said, okay, so we won't import the guns. Companies began importing all the parts, less the receiver, and slapping the guns together here. Sound familiar? I'm sure it does. Well, the government was quick to jump on this one. In November of 1990, they passed the Comprehensive Crime Control Act of 1990, which, among other travesties, added the much maligned Section 922R. The provision was added to the GCA to keep people from getting around Bush's extra-legal import ban by just importing the parts and assembling them onto U.S. receivers, which is pretty much what the law told them to do. Section 922R states simply that it is unlawful for any person to assemble from imported parts any semi-automatic rifle or shotgun that would be identical to one prohibited from importation because it's not sporty. Of course, it exempts items made for sale to law enforcement who are not ordinary people and are better than us and thus have more rights. As we see all too often, the text of the law itself is super short, so we have the agency in charge of enforcing the law interpret it themselves. This is, of course, kind of like asking a child when bedtime is. So they promulgated regulations implementing 922R at 27 CFR 478.39, listing 20 gun parts ATF considers major components. These are the receiver, barrel, barrel extension, trunnion, muzzle device, bolt, bolt carrier, op rod, gas piston, trigger housing, trigger, hammer, sear, disconnector, buttstock, pistol grip, forearm, magazine body, magazine flower, and magazine floor plate. When asked why they were being so awful, the ATF, oblivious to American history, responded, What do you mean this country was forged in fire with barrels smuggled from Europe? What are you talking about? Can't you see we're trying to help? So anyway, after making this list, ATF first attempted to interpret 922R to ban the assembly of firearms with only two imported parts, which would make putting a fancy imported trigger and hammer in a domestic rifle a crime. So yeah, people didn't like that. Mildly scolded, the ATF came back with its final rule in 1993, which we deal with now. It prohibits assembling guns with more than 10 of these parts. The logic was that this list of 20 parts were all the critical parts, and that with 11 of 20, the firearm would be primarily foreign in construction, and thus could be considered a foreign firearm. Because everyone knows foreign guns are killier than domestic ones. Well, now you might be thinking, what if they just make all the parts here? Well, if you make the exact same parts in the U.S., that's okay, because these are more expensive, an American flag, and apple pie, and union steelworker, etc. It's also kind of funny, in my opinion, that the magazine makes up three of those 20 critical parts, so you can wind up with a gun that's compliant one second, then swap the mag out, and suddenly it's not. So now, if we're deciding whether a particular gun is subject to 922R, the first question is whether it's a fuddy sporty gun. If it's not, we start counting parts. Remember, the prohibition is on assembly, not possession. 
The ATF even clarified in guiding documents that arms already lawfully imported into the United States could have any imported parts replaced with imported parts. This kind of irritates me when I see forum dwellers spazzing out on each other saying someone's gun isn't 922R compliant. Number one, don't snitch on the homies. Number two, dude, who says he assembled it? Go monitor someone else's hall. That's a good segue into the enforcement of 922R. People often think the law only applies to manufacturers and importers, and that's actually not the case, but there is some significance to that distinction. Unfortunately, the law does prohibit any person from assembling a non-sporty firearm with more than 10 imported parts. To convict someone under 922R, the government must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that an individual, knowing what they were doing was unlawful, assembled a non-sporting rifle or shotgun from imported parts. The word assembled has been interpreted as conduct as simple as replacing a single part. Given the fact that most of the controlled parts are unmarked, you might be wondering how the ATF enforces this against people like us. For example, an AR-15 trigger made in the US looks a lot like one made in Canada or Switzerland. Well, it's actually quite fascinating. You see, the agency has a group of highly trained special agents who spend all day blindfolded underneath ATF headquarters in Martinburg, West Virginia. Day in and day out, these men taste test fine specimens of imported steel by insufflating small quantities and then cataloging the flavor profile. This is repeated until the agent can identify the origin of steel, aluminum, wood, and polymer down to the square kilometer. Now, firearms subject to 922R prosecutions are then transported to the special agent's secret clubhouse, where these agents all take tiny shavings off all the controlled components and taste them. The agents then submit a report to the attorney general, who smiles at it. Of course, the government must still prove, beyond a reasonable doubt, that the individual knew that more than 10 parts were imported and that the assembly was unlawful. If the defendant does not simply snitch on himself, the government uses lie-detecting dogs to sniff out the truth. Despite all of these incredible tools, I could not find a single instance of a successful criminal prosecution of 922R against an individual. This doesn't mean it's never been prosecuted, it just means that I couldn't find a 922R case that went beyond the initial stages. So does it actually get enforced anywhere? Well, yes. This is why you'll see people misunderstanding that the law is only for FFLs because it is, quite routinely, used to justify denying licenses to firearms dealers, manufacturers, and importers. You see, to convict you criminally, the government has to prove all of the elements we've discussed beyond a reasonable doubt. That's a big burden, especially with something as murky as this. To take away a business's license, however, is much easier for the government to accomplish. Think of enforcing 922R against an individual as requiring 99% proof, while using it to take away a license needs only 51%. Plus, it's far easier to impute knowledge of the part's origin on a manufacturer or importer rather than on Joe Monday, who fished some cool-looking parts out of a bin. On that, I've seen a few cases where people have lost or been denied renewal of their licenses due to things like putting bayonets back onto SKS rifles that were imported without them, these are also often after the ATF specifically tells the shops not to assemble the firearms as such, so the knowledge requirement is met. As written, then, the law applies to everyone and makes it a felony to slap an extra part on a non-sporting rifle with 10 imported parts. In practical effect, though, it's used to prevent businesses from assembling and selling us the neato foreign firearms we really, really want. It seems many writers around the time of enactment thought both the import restrictions in the GCA and Section 922R were something the American gun industry was clamoring for, and I think there might be some truth to that. There are dozens of shops whose whole existence is predicated on these controls. Remember, it's all about importation. 922R affects very few AR-15 pattern rifles, and several U.S. companies spend all day churning out AK fire controls so people can assemble parts kits. Whether at the behest of industry or not, 922R is properly understood as an anti-consumer law. It drives up the cost and complexity of non-U.S. firearms. This isn't good for anyone except a few select special interests and cottage industries. So that's all I've got on this subject. If I missed anything, please let me know in the comments and I'll try to make a follow-up. I also just want to say I really appreciate you guys watching and subscribing. It makes a huge difference. If you want to support more than that, I just started up a Patreon and Subscribestar. I've added benefits like a patron-only podcast, a Discord, and surely more to come. 
This kind of support will help enable me to make more content more regularly, something I'd really love to be able to do. There's also a link to the FUDBuster sticker in the description below. Thank you all so much for watching to the end, and for your support. I'll see you next time, or if you become a patron or subscribe star, I'll see you on the Discord. Remember, the anti-side has been working long and hard, passing laws, and trying to make more. Anything more than minimum compliance is self-regulation. Y'all take care.